Michael Cruz, you have a story to tell, not only from a professional point of view, but also from a personal point of view. Where would you like to start? Oh, well, <laughs> um, well, I guess we can start from my personal experience, because that's what got me into um, my professional experience. Um, I, I had um, an eating disorder myself, and went through the whole recovery process and have been recovered for many, many years now. And um, Congratulations. Thank you. And with that, that's how I um, decided that I wanted to go into nutrition and dietetics, um, mainly just because I really wanted to help other people with the same, the same problems and wanted to give that back to other people that were, that were struggling with the same things that I had. Because you went through those things, you feel like you have a better understanding of being able to help people with Mm -hmm. with their relationship with food. You're a nutritionist. Yes, I am. <laughs> so you look at food from a health standpoint, from a nutrition standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's very, um, it's, it's confusing actually going from going to school for nutrition and dietetics to working with the eating disorder field because it feels like a lot of the things that we learn in school are this medical health perspective and yet we're trying to, um, as dietitians and eating disorders, change that view and go back to balance and everything's okay in moderation and, and feeding our body more from a, a soul perspective than what's prescribed, you know, to really check in intuitively and, and go back to using our body as a tool, which is the best mechanism that we have um, in our relationship to food. So it's almost reversing a lot of the things that we actually learn. About so nutrition. using your body as a tool, mm -hmm. meaning? Meaning that we were all born with this innate ability to check in with ourselves, to see what our body craves and desires. Um, just like a child who's not hungry anymore is going to refuse food. They're not going to continue eating. And we all have that built-in mechanism, but we have somehow detached from that for whatever reason. We start right. listening to what society tells us about what we should and shouldn't eat, versus going back inside and checking in with what our body desires. And that really is our best tool. Can we really trust our bodies though? Yes. I mean, that's the bottom line. It, yes. Yeah, I think so. Except mm -hmm. for we let so many other things come in the way of that relationship with ourselves. But when we're truly practicing self-care and we're truly checking in with our bodies, our body is our best tool to be able to recognize what we want and don't want. It's when we start putting shoulds and shouldn'ts and rules around food that we detach from being able to, to check in with our body. With, with the onset of all the power drinks and the mm -hmm. caffeine and fast foods, mm -hmm. processed, mm -hmm. the lack of nutritional foods that we right. eat, it seems to me like all oh, that's going to make it really, really, really difficult to listen to your body because now mm -hmm. you're not listening to your body, you're listening to your mouth, the taste, the sure. look. The well, advertisement. Yeah, well, and that's what does skew it. So now we're letting society get in the way of us actually checking in. But there is some mindfulness that goes into it as far as um, feeding our body well, knowing that we, we need to have fruits and vegetables and, you know, a balance of all these things. But when we're actually in tune with what our body wants, our body will crave fruits or vegetables. When we've been feeding it purely fast food all the time, if we're actually checking in, that doesn't feel good to our body but so many of us are so detached from that that we're unable to So how do you that. help people to listen? We have to, to feel start it. with structure. So being a dietitian oh. in nutrition, we really do need to go back to starting with structure again, to feeding the body regularly. So even though I'm saying that, yeah, we the ultimate goal is to be able to check in and listen intuitively to our body, that really is the ultimate goal. When we're so far from that because we haven't been listening to our body and we've been either starving it or overfeeding it, we're using whatever eating disorder mechanism has come in there, we need to go back to structure. So that's where the dietitian would come in and say, okay, this is the meal plan that your body needs right now to be balanced. Okay. And once we can do that, that relationship can start coming back because now we're feeding our body properly. And then we can start to check in with hunger and fullness cues again and listen to our cravings. But it takes that stepping back out of the disordered eating to be able to get to the intuitive So you can't leave again. You can't leap from this type of eating or not eating to being able to listen to your body. Because after a while, your body starts giving you distorted messages. I so, believe so. Some other people might say differently, but I believe that we need to okay. set up Okay, well, what would other people first. say, and why would they say that? Um, I think that there's some thought that, you know, 
in intuitive eating, which which is the ultimate goal again, um, some people think that you probably could take that big jump and just start checking back into your body. But I think that with something like you know anorexia, the body's so distorted, and we've come to a place where you know the person who's anorexic probably has no hunger and fullness cues at all anymore. So to start to go right into hunger and fullness, they don't even know what that feels like. Right. So we need to be able to feed the body regularly to set up some sort of pattern before we can even check in. It's a little bit like insomnia. You yeah. forget how to fall asleep, so you have to go through regulations and to right. get back to, oh, this is sleepiness, oh, this is awake. Yeah. Exactly. So you're waking up appetite. Yeah. Completely. And responding to it. Mm -hmm. And then you're fulfilling appetite and being able to push it away. Right. Okay. Um, as an as a nutritionist, mm -hmm. you're also the enemy yes. <laughs> for people who just don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. They're going to fight you. They're going to lie to you. They're going to tell secrets. Yes. <laughs> How do you know when they're doing that? Um, I think that there's there's some feeling that we all you know that to some degree we don't know. I can say to some degree I don't know okay. when someone's being honest or not. I can think that deceive, they are and they can deceive. They're deceitful, you know, and and, and they are. And that happens sometimes. But other times, I think also as human beings, and we possess energy when we're sitting here talking to each other, it's just like probably if, if your child lies to you, a lot of times you kind of can sense that and you know. And a lot of times it doesn't feel right. And so you know that something's about that. But the only thing that we can do is trust what they're saying. I mean, at times, especially with dietetics, you know, we have other clinical factors. We might be able to look at labs that are going to point to something different or look at weights that are going to point to something different. You tell me that you've been doing this, this, and that, yet you're losing weight. So what is this discrepancy about? So there's some aspects that we can look at, but other times we have to go with where the client's at, and if they're not ready to be honest, then we just have to work with that at that point. You looked almost hopeless when you said that. Let's like, um, well, they just may be in that place, and and it's sad because they think a lot of times with eating disorders, we see that they're not ready. Even when they come into treatment, they're just not ready yet. Mm -hmm. And and it is very sad, actually, being there day in and day out and, and seeing that, seeing that because I think that the client's hopeless. Really? A lot of times it seems that, you know, until they've hit their rock bottom, seems like this still works for them, you know, and so maybe they don't see that there's anything better than this. So do you play psychological games with them? And, I mean, if, because they're, they're kind of psyched out, mm -hmm. they're lying to you, they're lying to the family, mm -hmm. you're the police, Right. the police <laughs> is going to get them in trouble, they don't want the judgment. Mm -hmm. so, do you, so do you figure out ways to twist through it or maneuver um, or is it all straightforward a little bit i think i'm pretty straightforward about most everything and trying okay. not to get involved in the games okay. of it so to like if it, look at the facts well it says this this and this so what's actually going on here let's talk about that um but to some degree there's always that you know psychological perspective that we have to take as well and look at well what might they be trying to do here and how can we go in the other way or um, did you, you, you got your training specifically because you had an eating disorder and you wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that you would have gone some other direction if you hadn't had your experience with eating disorders? Yeah, I think so. Um, I was, you know, going to college and I was going to be a biology major and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until um, my eating disorder really went full force and that kind of led me out of school actually to really get into recovery and allow, allowed me to reassess what I wanted to do with my life and I think that was partially a contributing factor here I was going to school for something that I really didn't know that that's what I wanted to do or how I was how I was going to help people with that and um, so to be able to step back and reassess was really helpful for me and being the biology major I was really interested in the body and the way it worked as well so nutrition was kind of a natural progression for me um, to go in that direction but really struggling with that and seeing the light on the other side coming out of recovery and just really seeing life for all that it could be rather than um, stuck in this box of the eating disorder which you know how I see I wanted other people to be able to experience that, that as well. That phrase I can really see how life was meant to be. Mm -hmm. I've heard that so many times mm -hmm. during this, this show. Mm -hmm. Well, why was it so hard to see life as it really could be when you're in the midst of an eating disorder? An eating disorder?
disorder, that's its purpose, is to focus you only on the eating disorder. So you literally become stuck in a box of the eating disorder. And it's about, you, you know, whatever your eating disorder entails, whether it's counting calories or binging and purging or just focusing on getting as much food as you possibly can, whatever it is, that's the point of it, is to distract and to focus solely on those things so that you don't have to deal with the rest of life. So if you're using it for its purpose, which, you know, the coping mechanism that it is, you're stuck in that and that's all you can see. And you can't see the light outside of that. So when you go into nutrition, mm -hmm. as a person who's experienced eating mm -hmm. disorder, how does nutrition not become its own box? Um, how, how does anybody that says, okay, I'm going to eat now healthily, right. how does that not become its own compulsion? It can. Oh, it can. It definitely okay. can. And I think that's a big part of even what I was saying kind of before about trying to almost reteach nutrition in that way because I think even going through nutrition having recovered, there's a lot of stuff that's going through my head. Um, going through nutrition can lead to an eating disorder in itself. A lot of dietitians may have eating disorders because we, we learn about food in this rigid way about this is good, this is bad, instead of moderation and accepting all foods. So it's really being able to take in that information and filter it properly. And having gone through the recovery process and working with a really good dietitian that taught me to do that already, and then going into the nutrition field, um, I was kind of able to take that information and really balance it versus um, take it just the scientific facts that these are good or these are bad. Or so now, do you celebrate when you eat food? Do, I do you laugh and have fun oh, and yes. enjoy and taste? and Completely. Yes, yes and your favorite yeah. thing to eat is? Oh my gosh, I love all food. But I'm an Italian girl, so I love spaghetti. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that you've been able to identify either s some complication or some freedom inside of you to be able to move beyond the complications of eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you. This is Dr. Carol Francis. Till later.